ahead of a crucial meeting of EU leaders in Brussels tonight, Donald Tusk says he has no optimism that a Brexit deal will be reached. With negotiations at an impasse, the European Council president says UK Prime Minister Theresa May must bring concrete proposals to the table. Well, earlier I spoke to Simon Usherwood, Deputy Director of the Brexit think tank UK in a changing Europe. I began by asking him how he thinks this deadlock can be broken. It's a deadlock now. It's, it's a deadlock that's been there for uh, many months now. And I think that really reflects the difficulty of the situation. We're, we're seeing some things coming through in uh, recent days, in the past week, but nothing uh, that works both for the EU and for the UK. And I think this is the real challenge that whilst there might be some technical agreements that are possible uh, between the two negotiating uh, groups, the real difficulty at the moment seems to be what can be uh, acceptable to the British Parliament because they're going to have to approve this deal as well. And I, I think that was part of why we had the uh, delays and the, the, the blockages over the weekend. Well, as you say, this is now, it's coming down now to sort of rhetoric, to this is a game of, of poker, a negotiating game with Tusk uh, calling on May to bring concrete proposals to the table. Is there a sense that May and the, and the UK side are going into this, uh, this summit tonight on the back foot? Uh, not so much. I think part of the difficulty is that both sides think that the, other, the others have been a bit unreasonable. So both sides are saying uh, you need to come forward with proposals. So the UK wants that from the EU. The EU want that from the UK. And uh, we risk having uh, the same situation that we saw in Salzburg last month where uh, – Everyone was waiting on everyone else and it, it got slightly bad tempered. Um, and I think there was an awareness that that wasn't a very helpful uh, situation. So really trying to, to make sure that there is an advance. But from what we know, the British government haven't got uh, new proposals to table, which means that I think this meeting is likely to be very much a stock taking exercise by the EU, trying to decide whether they want to have another meeting next month uh, to try and move things on or whether they want to put more effort into preparing for a no deal, and partly because they worry that a no deal might genuinely happen, but also uh, to show the, uh, the UK that they are uh, prepared for the worst, and uh, as far as they're concerned, uh, the UK will suffer a lot more from not agreeing something. And just quickly, you know, on the UK side, uh, deep divisions, all this is sort of complicated by the fact that uh, even on the UK negotiating side, there are people who perhaps have voted remain, people who voted leave. Uh, and this ever evolving question of the people's vote that still uh, that still is calling for a second referendum. Is there a sense, do you have a sense that that could ever materialise? At the moment, that looks still really unlikely. Uh, if you remember how much uh, Theresa May was unwilling to let even Parliament have a say in this process, uh, she's even less likely to, to be uh, willing to let uh, uh, the population have another vote. And uh, you'll remember that one of the reasons we're in this situation is that the referendum did go the way that the government of the day thought that it would. So it, it introduces a lot more uncertainty uh, to the process. It introduces a lot more delay uh, to the process. And I think really Theresa May's view has always been we have to leave on the 29th of March next year. And yeah. if that means yeah. uh, pushing through Parliament, then so be it. There will be no exceptions in the search for those responsible for the disappearance of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. That's the promise Saudi authorities have made to U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Pompeo flew into Ankara from Saudi Arabia a short time ago. He'll be meeting Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan later today. Before leaving Riyadh, he told reporters he'd stressed that to the royal family, uh, the, to the Saudi royal family, the importance of a complete investigation into the disappearance of Khashoggi from the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Over there we're going to conduct a thorough, complete, transparent investigation. They made a commitment to, to hold uh, anyone connected to any wrongdoing that may be found accountable for that, whether they are uh, a senior officer or official. Uh, they promised accountability for each of those persons whom they determined as a result of their investigation has, uh, d deserves accountability. Including a member of the royal family? They made no exceptions to who they would hold accountable. They were, they were just very, they were very clear. They, un they understand the importance of this issue. They're determined to get to the bottom of it and that they will conduct the report. And we'll, we'll all get a chance to see it. 
U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo there. Well, Turkish officials, uh, meanwhile, have been searching the consulate where Hashogi uh, was last seen 15 days ago. They say they will reveal their evidence uh, on what happened to him within a matter of days. NBC's chief correspondent, Bill Neely, gives us the latest on the investigation in Istanbul. Turkish police sealing off the home of a top Saudi diplomat and searching for a second night for clues to a suspected murder. A forensic team has taken soil samples, bricks and other evidence from the nearby Saudi consulate. Including, says Turkey's president, toxic materials and evidence that the Saudis repainted walls inside, literally covering something up in the building they showed to journalists last week where Jamal Khashoggi was last seen. The Saudis aren't allowing the Turkish police here to interview any of their officials. And just hours before the search here began, the top Saudi diplomat fled this house. Turkey is convinced Khashoggi was killed at the consulate. Detectives say evidence will likely be revealed within days. What they haven't found yet after two weeks is the body of the missing journalist. Bill Neely, NBC News, Istanbul. Well, uh, to have a look at these new developments, I'm joined now by journalist Christina Jovanovsky. She's outside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul for us. Good morning, Christina. Uh, we've got Pompeo meeting Erdogan uh, later today. What can we expect from that meeting? Perhaps Washington is going to try to uh, further the cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. These are two important allies in a volatile region. Turkey is an important NATO member state. It provides a major military contribution to the military alliance. Saudi Arabia, of course, provides a lot of oil to the U.S., as well as a lot of money in terms of arms deals, as the U.S. President Donald Trump has, uh, has brought up. Uh, as well, um, the Secretary of State from the U.S. had brought up that Saudi Arabia was committed to a tr transparent investigation. That'll raise some questions, though. Is it possible for Saudi Arabia to really credibly uh, investigate itself. Uh, and before all of this, we've seen uh, President Erdogan publicly, publicly commenting uh, on the investigation. What can we make of that? Perhaps this is a strategy to increase pressure on Saudi Arabia and Washington. Analysts had told me earlier when there was these leaks from the investigation, it was a strategy to get Saudi Arabia and the U.S. to react more quickly or more harshly to these uh, developments, to this disappearance. Uh, so Erdogan might feel like he's in a sensitive uh, position here. We saw U.S. President Donald Trump had given some positive uh, uh, remarks to the Saudi uh, leadership, saying that they were being presumed guilty before the facts were known. That could concern Turkey. Would the U.S. be prioritizing its relationship with an important uh, Middle East ally over Turkey? Canada has officially legalized the recreational use of cannabis, making it the second and largest country in the world to do so. Queues formed in the province of Newfoundland at midnight, where the first sales of legal marijuana have taken place. Canadians will now be able to legally buy up to 30 grams of cannabis for personal use. Supporters have argued that it would cut some 4 billion euros worth of black market profits, but there will be strict regulations on where and how pot can be consumed. Well, earlier I spoke to D Dana Larson, a cannabis rights campaigner and the owner of a medical marijuana shop in Vancouver. I started by asking him why he won't be applying for a government license to sell recreational marijuana. The problem with this legalization is it's only, a company, it's only accounting for uh, dried buds. So extracts and edibles and capsules and medicinal products like that aren't going to be available for at least a year or maybe longer. So I'm not going to be transitioning into the legal market, but many people are and I wish them luck. OK. And are you confident that this is a first step for the government and that, that uh, the idea that uh, places like your own will be able to uh, market their cannabis legally may be down the line? I hope so, yeah. It's going to be a long transition period. We're only opening one shop here in the whole province of, of British Columbia, yet there's a couple of hundred of shops already op operating outside of the law. So it's going to be an interesting transition. Uh, you know, we, we applaud what's happening, but we're also concerned that a lot of people that are currently in the cannabis industry are going to be shut out and that to participate in, in the legal industry, you're going to need to be a multimillionaire already just to get into the system. So we want to see a more open and fair system than what we're going to get. 
Well, it is interesting you say that because uh, it's, there's actually a 23 year old student in Saskatchewan who, who did get one of the seven uh, permits there. But I just want to quickly ask you uh, about the, uh, you know, we're, we're talking here about a psychotropic substance. If abused, it can have enormous health implications and risks. Uh, is that a worry? What would you say to people who are concerned about that? Oh, well, that's not a risk at all. And, and, and really, the, all the harms of cannabis are magnified by cannabis prohibition. And by any measure, cannabis is far, far safer of a choice than alcohol is. And so we should not be regulating cannabis more strictly than alcohol. And, and certainly the prohibition of cannabis began in racism and ignorance and bigotry, and it never became a good idea. Uh, so ending the scourge of cannabis prohibition, I think, will be a wonderful thing for Canada and people all around the world as this spreads.